In this video, I'm in extreme danger. It's the Chevrolet Corvair. Now let's get one thing out of the way um, already. The Chevrolet Corvair, very famously the target of Ralph Nader, who campaigned against the car, released a book saying unsafe at any speed, uh, reckoned it was dangerous and cost cutting had made the Corvair um, a seriously dangerous bit of kit. Um, firstly, that was proved to be a load of baloney, but not until the 1970s. And secondly, this is a second generation Corvair. This one dates from 1965. That's the year that they released this improved version. It was lower, it was sleeker. This is the gorgeous Monza Coupe version. And uh, yeah, the considerable revisions to the rear suspension. Uh, famously, the Chevrolet Corvair is rear engined. It has an air cooled rear engine Hence the um, rather amusing number plate of US Volkswagen, because it, it sort of is. Uh, it's very windy, I hope that's not being a problem. Um, this is Wellington for you. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the wheels are not the owner's choice. They were on the car when he got it. I can't entirely make my mind up about them. I think I would probably prefer a smaller car for ride comfort, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, we think it's probably been lowered very slightly, but they were always very low, these second generation cars. So they kind of looked pretty awesome straight from the factory. Notice it's got quad headlamps here as well. Now the development is quite interesting of the Corvair because it is so, so very different. It's not your typical front engine V8 barge. And uh, perhaps even more amusingly, the development of this car was overseen by Ed Cole, who is... Um, generally regarded as the father of the small block V8. Uh, he was chief engineer at General Motors, or at Chevrolet, um, when that engine was developed. And he was actually general manager of Chevrolet. He'd been promoted when the Corvair was developed. So um, yeah, the, the, the um, grandfather of the V8 was responsible for the Corvair. Um, he, he certainly, um, he, he might not have designed the Corvair, but he would certainly have been um, involved in its development he would have overseen it he would have okayed it he would have said yes this is what we need we need a an air cooled flat six engine in an american car i think the proportions are spectacular i think it's a beautiful looking car and i love the um the shape i mean this roof line is almost european uh, i can see elements of carmen gear there and um pininfarina bodies on ferraris and the like and maseratis it's got all that going on there it's a beguiling shape we've got the fuel filler on the front because the fuel tank is in the front and uh, you've also got this um, frunk um, which is the storage area but i think we will start by having a look inside the corvair uh, because it's quite interesting this example does have modern seats out of a ford mondeo i think and uh, yes they're not right for the car but nonetheless they're what's fitted to the car i didn't straight the steering wheel cardinal sin uh i'll show jump aboard and we can show you what's going on we've got um frameless doors um for a start and uh, they're frameless in the back as well so in fact i will jump back out to show you how beautiful that looks because um especially with no seat belts uh, there's no upper mount on the seat belts uh, they're just lap belts it just makes it all the more beautiful i think gorgeous i do love a pillarless coupe right now we're aboard we can see the simple um instrumentation ahead of the driver speedometer over here in miles of course uh, a clock which is sadly not functioning and a fuel gauge which also isn't functioning and some warning lights and as you will have seen in the earlier video i did actually break down in this car that light came on the temperature overheat and told me something was wrong with the fan belt uh, it's got a different belt on it now we'll look at it in a minute it's much much better but very very simple dashboard there really isn't much going on uh, that's the wiper switch combined with um, the screen wash there and i think that must be lights as well i don't know what that one is 
horn. That's what that one is. I could probably have worked that out, really. We've got fresh air ventilation down here, which is awesome. You don't need the windows open, frankly. And the handbrake, which is rather too much of a stretch away. If I've got static three-point seat belts, I don't think I'd reach that because look how far it goes. It's almost down at the clutch pedal. So not the most convenient. Lovely wood-rimmed steering wheel. I really like that. That's very classy. Oh, obviously, they just never wired that button up. Single stalk just for the indicators. No headlamp flasher. Ah, um, oh, no main beam because main beam is down here on a foot-mounted dip switch. You will notice a huge amount of space down here. There's no transmission tunnel because there's no transmission up here. It's all at the back. So you've got a big flat floor. Lots of space for your clutch foot. It's, um, yeah, absolutely marvellous down here. And then we've just got the ignition switch and a cigarette lighter, I would assume. And a, a modern stereo, which looks a bit classy and old. So I quite like that. Not what I've listened to it. And down here, heater controls, which are considerably more simple than a Porsche 911. And um, I may make references to Porsche 911 because it just kind of feels apt. Uh, this is the response to the Porsche 911 that came out years before the 911 even existed. Uh, so um, it's all good. We've got a little uh, glove box here. There's an AccuSpark ignition on it. Oh yes, I've had this issue before. It doesn't latch all that well. There we go. And uh, you can see we've got opening quarter lights, although the rubbers aren't very good, so I'm not going to open those. I made that mistake the other day. Simple pull handle to get out. Some beefy um, stereo speakers. There's a little cubby down here for odds and sods. And a little cupboard down here for you glue stick we, we have no idea where that came from the owner thought it was mine but nope not my glue stick and here is the curious gear lever with this strange curve on it and a little ball this is really uncomfortable on the fingers so you, you kind of have to control it like this and I'll take you through the gears it's a very close little ratio box it's quite snickety again far better than a Porsche 911 uh, I must admit, um, although occasionally trying to find the right gear is difficult and reverse, you kind of have to slap it over and go there and that might have been first or reverse, it's hard to tell. But it's a, it's a really nice little lever for snicking through the gears actually, very pleasant um, on the move. Um, I've done quite a few miles in the passenger seat of this car and again very spacious, also got an independent fresh air vent over there. There's the Monza badge, which is, I think Monza was the coupe version. But unfortunately, these aren't tipping seats. So the rear seat really is for um, storage only. Um, it's a bit of a pain, really. But um, I shall take the keys with us and we shall start with a look at the frunk area. But here we go. We are into the frunk area and quite spacious. Obviously got a spare wheel in here. Uh, the fair fan belt we um, had to, well, which came off the other day during a test. And you'll see we've got a manual brake servo and a screen washer bottle, which actually tells you how many pints of fluid you've got left. Uh, wiper motor also located under here. So, yeah, not an awful lot of weight, really. Fuel tank will be lying under here, but otherwise not a lot of weight on that front end. But, yeah, a bit of a faff to open because you have to use the key an internal lever would be a lot easier engine access is a little easier uh, if I remember rightly there is a lever under here somewhere I thought yes there it is and there we go uh, a much more robust uh, stay on a windy day so um, here is the air cooled flat six engine we've got a different belt fitted now much slimmer belt sits nicer in the groove I love that they added this thing to try and stop the belt wiggling its way off. I mean, it kind of tells you there's a problem going on, really, doesn't it? But 2.7 litres, it would originally have been 95 brake horsepower. This was a lower powered engine. Uh, optional was 110. Um, or there, there was a turbocharged um, Corvair. Now, don't get too confused because all Corvair engines were called Turbo Air, um, even if they weren't turbocharged. But there was a turbocharged version, I think that was 150 brake horsepower. But then later on they did a more powerful uh, naturally aspirated engine which was 140 brake horsepower and kind of made a lot more sense. It wasn't the first turbocharged car, um, that was the Oldsmobile Turbo Fire. 
um, which also came out in the same year, 1962 I think it was, that the turbos came out. So America was actually leading Europe in that regard. But yeah, a lovely sounding engine, um, not too difficult to work on, most of it is accessible. Um, and uh, you'll notice um, these plates on the carburettors, obviously not very original, and nor are the carburettors, these are off uh, Mazda 323 and uh, they seem to do a very good job little pancake filters would originally have had rochester carburettors four of them which doesn't make any sense to me why would you have four carburettors single choke carburettors on a six cylinder engine somehow chevrolet made it work but it's hard to know how much power this is putting out but it, it's somewhere over 100 brake horse i would say judging by the way it picks up and very torquey engine as well as we'll see um, now I'm going to have a quick liar on underneath the car because there's some interest under here although it's very difficult to show it off. Uh, the, uh, you can see the different rear suspension design here um, where it, it's effectively kind of a uh, double wishbone with the drive shaft being uh, an upper link I think. It's very similar to the um, Corvette just revised. It was originally swing axle rear suspension and uh, swing axle was popular because in effect the wheel w worked in the same arc as the drive shaft so you didn't need any sliding joints or uv uh, universal joints um, so this is a, a bit more complex but a lot more stable and uh, i think it's coil spring on the back yes there i can see just about see one of the coil springs uh, it doesn't have the transverse leaf of the corvette so it's a similar principle but it's not exactly um, Corvette suspension. The four-speed manual gearbox, transaxle um, sitting here between the wheels. Uh, so yeah, a very interesting engine bay. Uh, the alternator is fixed in position, the tension is adjusted here and you, you should set the tension so you can move the belt. You should be able to pull it uh, by hand. Um, this, this has got warm now so you set it when cold so it won't slip um, but that's apparently what you do. Here's the oil filter it's a conversion to a spin-on not much access but um, easier to change from the cartridge type looks like it's got a pertronics flamethrower coil and it does also have electronic ignition so it starts and runs really well um, I hope that isn't uh, famous last words oh got to undo this myself have I or will it no there we go Jobs are good, so there, American air-cooled classic. There aren't many of those about. Uh, you probably want to go for a drive. I certainly want to go for a drive. So um, let's go for a drive. Sadly, I'm going to have to do the windows up. Right, that's a bit of a different angle for you. Uh, the car's wide enough that I can have you right next to me for a driver's eye view. So. Starts up very nicely. And unsurprisingly, it sounds like a Porsche 911. Uh, let's find my seatbelt. And the uh, buckle is on the sill side. Uh, just have to reach past you for the handbrake. That is a stupid, stupid place for it. And uh, we can get this journey underway. Manual steering and with those modern tyres modern quite wide tyres, it's a bit of a handful but as soon as you're moving even slowly it lightens up because there's no weight at the front It's a very tall first gear so it feels like you're pulling away in second And then it doesn't sound very American at all, does it? But it's a very talky engine. So you don't have to go hunting for reds, it'll actually pull along quite merrily just on the torque. A fair bit of wind noise, just because you got, you know, opening quarter lights, frameless doors. It's all a recipe for a not particularly quiet journey. But 
lovely comfortable driving position the steering wheel falls very nicely to hand and because the pillars are so small or non-existent in the case of the B pillar uh, it's really easy to see out of so joining a motorway a slip road you turn over your right shoulder to check your blind spot and the view is spectacularly good it's easier to join a motorway than it is in a right-hand drive car but I, I've done a fair bit of driving in this car now and uh, I can find nothing to fault with the handling um, I can see the swing axle rear suspension has its limitations anyone who's driven a Triumph Herald or Renault 8 will know exactly what I'm on about. You have to be a bit respectful because um, because the simple wheel um, alignment at the rear, it just follows the line of the drive shaft. So it's possible for a wheel to tuck under if you um, suddenly lift off and move the weight of the car around. You have to be very careful with them. Yeah, lovely car to drive, lovely precise gear lever and uh, the steering isn't brilliant because um, it's a steering box and it's um, yeah fairly vague and uh, wobbly but it's easy enough to place the car it's just um, yeah if you want to squeeze through a gap you wouldn't do it at speed because you wouldn't have the confidence you could put it exactly where you want it but despite the wind that's blowing around today it, it doesn't feel um, unstable in crosswinds which a lot of rear engine cars can do that the brakes are servoless drums which may seem surprising in a car which is considered as a bit of a sports car in its day really but then you know Dodge Chargers with V8 engines could be um, specified with drum brakes the Americans didn't seem very keen on stopping Coming up. Got my lights on. It was a bit too sharp for nailing it. If you're thinking my lane discipline's bad, don't worry, everyone's like that here. There really is no such thing as um, lane discipline. But the corner's really flat with all that weight down low um, behind the rear wheels. Feels very planted actually. It isn't the most peaceful of cars. Air cooled engines, by their very nature, are quite loud, and this one does have a fairly fruity exhaust on it as well. In fact, a separate pipe for each bank of three cylinders, so it's like having two slightly demented Deu Matizes chasing you down the road. Look at that Nissan Maxima there with a rear wiper. Whoa. The ride is a little bit jiggly. I suspect a bit more um, tyre sidewall compliance would improve it, but it's not uncomfortable. It goes really well over speed humps. Um, it's very composed. It seems very well damped. Just the, um, yeah, the, the jiggle of um, not having enough tyre, really. I mean, I, I like sidewalls. Sidewalls are an important part of the suspension system. Uh, which is why I don't like low profile tyres. Wipers. Oh dear. We have a triangle of doom. That's um, unfortunate. 
just for the sake of completeness and because the controls are a lot easier to understand uh, I've got the fan you push down to operate so that's the fan at maximum maximum heat maximum defrost and that is really quite warm um, you have to say so um, for a rearranging car that's not bad going at all oh, I need to turn that off that is um, too hot none of the hot none of the defrost stick to my fresh air vents and in this case an open window and uh, yeah hopefully all is well slightly disappointing about the wipers but um, I suppose not every car can be perfect can it so um, there we go well that rather concludes um, this test of this um, remarkable American car that's unlike any other American car um, I liked it a lot more than I thought I would although I did have a little inkling it might be my cup of tea but um, it, it's just how pleasant it is to drive that really makes it special it's um, entirely joyous it's it's easy it's a really well thought out car despite what history would have you believe and uh, it feels quite safe I've been cornering fairly hard in it I'm not going to go completely crazy it is a 1960s car after all but um, yeah it's absolutely fine I love it it cruises nicely lots of torque lovely engine noise very much my cup of tea so i hope you've enjoyed that it's a bit of a break from the norm really i uh, didn't come all the way to new zealand expecting this opportunity hugely thankful to ian for letting me drive this and his 911 there's an interesting pair of um, comparisons the flat six um air cooled beasts but yeah it's been absolutely lovely really enjoyed it so um i should say thank you very much for watching and i look forward to seeing you in a future video now i'm going to go and do some sunbathing i think as i'm dressed for it but the wind is um not entirely set fair. Farewell. Oh my gosh, live, live scenes, there is a shark in the water. Oh, it's inflatable. I managed to rescue the shark. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can reunite it with the people who want it?